You're very welcome along to the Keith Andrews Show. Joining me today, the golden ticket winner is Mr. Dave McIntyre, my former international teammate, Kevin Doyle. As ever, you can join us on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook platforms. Please get in touch. Any questions for Kevin in particular, get them in and we will ask him. Um, so we've got a football man, Dave, rugby man now this week or a bit of both. I'm, I'm, I'm whatever people need me to be Okay. at, at any particular given time of the year. And Kevin Doyle now a GAA man. Oh, thanks. Keith. As news yeah. breaks this morning that you are heavily involved in the infrastructure <laughs> and future <laughs> of Wexford GAA. That broke very nicely uh, for us this morning. Didn't it? You, I was wondering why you were so happy to see me this morning. <laughs> Big smile on your face, handshake. Sure, we hadn't seen each other in years. <laughs> <laughs> so come on, give us a lowdown. No, happy to help out. A friend of mine is involved, Eric Bradley, who I played soccer with, and. Uh, and football with grown up and he's uh, he was a former county footballer and he's now involved with the under 20s and he rang me a few weeks ago just wondering if I'd go in and speak to the lads and help out a few nights and just you know bring a I suppose he want bring a bit of publicity and bring a bit of you know something else to it um, you know I haven't I haven't been watching a whole lot of Gaelic football over the years so since I, since I stopped playing so um, but it'll be fun it'll be fun to uh, see something a bit different and um, help in whatever way I can um, we've had a tweet in from PJ Banville yeah. Uh, on the 20 football management team. We're delighted to announce Mr. Kevin Doyle on an advisory role <laughs> as goalkeeping coach. A great addition. As goalkeeping coach? No, that's Morgan. Do you know Morgan? He, he played in goal uh, well, for the Wexford underage soccer teams the as future, well. The future is bright. Yeah. Sure take on Getting that. soccer lads Dave. involved. But when you were, were breaking into the Ireland team, it was the golden era of Wexford football. They got to an All-Ireland semi-final that year, yeah. around 2008. What year did you make your debut? 06? Um, first squads were 05 and my actual debut was Sweden in 06 ok yeah. so they were coming they were well, coming for us at the time Maddie was yeah, still hanging around yeah. Kieran Ling was breaking into the team PJ yeah. he's still in the team he was yeah and he was in that team Eric Bradley who rang me who I played soccer with and football with growing up he was, he was in the team then as well And um, you're on the road now to help them recapture <sighs> former glories yeah I don't know what I'm going to add to the mix <laughs> <laughs> at least we're talking about it so exactly um, so they'll be yeah. delighted but look we're going to talk to Kev a lot more about his career his retirement, obviously, in the last few months. Uh, but I want to start with last night's Champions League. Uh, Liverpool Porto. I was on Real Madrid PSG, so I've seen very, very little of this. Lads, you were watching this game. No surprise, I think, in terms of the goals that they get, how effective they are going forward. But that, that's a statement, Dave. It is. I, five goals is, is a surprise. Mm. I thought they'd struggle not to get out of the tie I didn't think they'd struggle in this away leg but that they would have to take their time in trying to break Porto down that they'd have one or two scares of their own at the back mm. but it was like watching a top division side draw a non-league team in the league in the FA Cup Porto were absolutely horrendous last night and they're a team that are pretty solid they do have obviously an awful lot of European pedigree it's a hostile enough place to go it was full their league form was decent and they barely had an opportunity at all last night but you got the real sense was that once the first Liverpool goal went in that they were done how, that the how, tie was done how highly do you rate that front three of Firmino Coutinho I'm <sighs> oh, sorry Coutinho yeah. left now man looking at last night they were class Porto like Liverpool could have been two or three not before they got their mm. first goal Porto played into their hands so as well as Liverpool played Porto were you know, they were playing out short from the back. Liverpool were loving a press of win. Their goals came all the time from just winning it high up the pitch from Porto playing out. Their keeper was throwing it away. It was almost like Porto had never seen Liverpool yeah, play yeah. before. I'm not sure what sort of preparation they put into this. The draw was made two months ago. They know exactly what Liverpool have been doing. All they had to do was watch the DVD of Liverpool's win over Manchester City a few times. But as Kevin said, they just played exactly how Liverpool would have liked them to have played. So where are they now then in terms of challenging for... The Champions League offensively to be able to score at will in the way they do and not solely reliant on one player to get the goals yeah. maybe like a, a Harry Kane might yeah. have in the main for Spurs they spread them around obviously Salah's got the majority this year but it's three prongs now obviously Coutinho left I actually feel that the team isn't better but it's it's more balanced without Coutinho because they're they're less likely to be counted on um, so how, how how highly do you rate them how far can they go on this there's less baggaging since Coutinho left as well less stuff to talk about for people up, uh, aside from the football um, who knows you know they've no centre forward there's no pressure on one guy to score it's not like you're the number nine so they, you know they can float around and one guy doesn't score there's no one getting on his back to, you know everyone's coming up with goals but can you you know what it's like if you're pressing and playing at that tempo that high can you do that I don't know it's so hard the amount of games in, in England and the amount of games Liverpool will be playing um 
you know, it's so hard to be at that tempo and everybody at that mm. pace to, to play the way they play. But it seems like they've, they've, when they do have an off day, like Mane went through a bit of a dip in form, didn't he, going back, and now he's kind of burst back onto the scene. Salah has just been fairly consistent all the way through. You're right in terms of that work rate, trying to keep that going, and he has tried to give them that little bit of a rest, but the fact that they're not dependent on one surely gives them a better chance. And these, I think they've started to look a little bit better defensively. Yeah, I, do I think they have. I think... The proof is that in that little bit of a spell that Mane went through, that they didn't actually struggle to score goals. Mm. I think they've played, now they've played nine game, games in Europe this year and they've scored over 30 goals, which is an incredible Stagnant. return. But the biggest issues they had were defensively. Moreno's no longer in the team, which is obviously a Thank plus. God. Yeah. Carius looks like he's been given the benefit of the doubt from his manager and that, you know, if you throw in a couple of clangers, we're not just going to yeah. jettison you from the team like we did yourself or Mignolet for so long. So he's actually playing with a bit more confidence. He made a couple of decent saves last night before Liverpool mm. went to goal up. And they've obviously spent all that money on Virgil van Dijk. Um, Kevin, you mentioned the fact that Coutinho is not on the team anymore. So, and it it gives them an opportunity to get another workhorse into the team. Mm. So now you have those three that are going to play together in every game. Plus, I think the West Brom defeat at Anfield in the Cup is a blessing when it comes to the Champions League mm. because they've got the week off now. So they've had to travel to Porto. They know they don't have another game for a week and a half. They can put their feet up, they can recover, the and batteries. they can recharge the batteries. So I think a few of their minor issues that they had there was about four or five of them one by one they're being dealt with I would be fearful of playing Liverpool if I was any team left in the competition they probably need a slightly favourable draw like they're probably not in the top four or five favourites to win this competition but if you can score that often at will any team is going to struggle to contain you over two legs whether it's a Juventus or whether it's a Barcelona although the chances of them getting Juventus now in the quarterfinals are receding as well I've said this before about England's national team and I think it applies to their their kind of expectation levels in the Champions League as well I don't know why especially Liverpool and Spurs not so much Man City because I think they play in a different style but why don't they try and make the European games like Premier League games because we'll, we'll speak about it in a little bit about Real Madrid and PSG they're not used to that type of tempo of game so it baffles me when the international team England and the teams like Liverpool why did they not try and make that tempo because they would be favoured sure. yeah. well Liverpool did yeah. it's, part, you, it's unusual I haven't seen as much I've been away obviously not living in the country but I haven't seen as many European games and to see Liverpool play like that it was like a Premier League game the way they were pressing usually you, you turn on a European game and just sit back and it's just a bit of passing in the back and it's just slow and it's a bit more predictable but this was like watching Liverpool play every week they didn't change their style against Porto away which you know you, you go there they're a very good team and always are and um, to see them just close them down close high up the pitch 90 minutes keep doing it it's mm. it's nice to see as you say with England I don't know why England, it suits English players I know Liverpool's not made up of a whole lot of English players but it suits English mentality Irish mentality to press to run yeah. to hurry not to sit back yeah, not to sit back. Yeah. so called pressure and you, you're same with English why wouldn't they mm. you know do that Yeah, it, mm. it's, it's their advantage right last night's the biggest game in town was Real Madrid I might be a little bit biased on that one Real Madrid against PSG now going into this game PSG were favourites which is remarkable to think about Real Madrid back-to-back -back Champions League winners. Ronaldo, I have no doubt, would have been feeling, why is there not a lot of talk about me, considering he had scored at every group game, nine goals in six group games. All the talk was about Neymar and Cole, Mbappe, Cavani. They showed PSG last night in a way where, in terms of how to take the chances, how to be efficient, the experience just oozed through in terms of the performance, wasn't amazing but they were clinical. Were you surprised by that, Dave, in terms of Madrid being able to produce a performance like that? I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I never doubted that they had a performance like that in them, but I just wondered how much their self-belief and their confidence had eroded in the last few months when they were struggling so regularly in the Liga games. They get fairly average opposition yeah. at times and leaving an awful lot of points behind them, missing a lot of big chances. And I thought when Rabiot scored that, well, this will just... It's another dent in whatever fragile confidence they had given the form they've shown over the last few weeks but it actually just emboldened them they they responded to the concession of that goal mm. really well and from about the 25th 13th minute onwards they were comfortably the better team it had echoes of what happened on Tuesday night in Turin where a team goes down and then pretty much dominates the rest of the game I was hugely disappointed with the PSG midfield I mean, I'm a massive fan of Marco Verratti the performance he gave in the first leg against Barcelona last season it's is as notch, good as it? I've seen from a centre midfield yeah. player for quite some time last night he barely got a kick 
Rabio is usually far more influential and stronger um, physically in the in the midfield area. He was terrible after he scored. Lo Celso is not up to that level just oh, yet. He's only twenty one. Inexperienced, Sean Trude. And it? you wonder, like, why was Blaise Matuidi allowed to leave the club? Considering he was just the kind of guy they needed yesterday. Twenty last million night. they sold him to the event. Yeah, it wasn't it's very exactly odd. financial reasons. They just obviously felt they needed to move certain players on. Thiago Motta was a big miss. I thought. I know he's thirty five, but he's pivotal in terms of how they play. How did you see this game going into it? Did you would you have put PSG yeah, favourites? You would just yeah. without really thinking about it. You would, but Ronaldo, you know, he's sort of saving himself for the Champions League. It seems like this year, um, he's getting older. He would have hated that, as he said, not been talked about. He's the main man. Would have, wouldn't he? Yeah, you know, and that's why he's the great player he is. That would stupid stuff like that, where he should be bigger than that, would frustrate him. And you seem to get the opinion he would be jealous about that. And he comes out and shows him he's still still the top dog. Thirty three now. Maybe it's as you get older, there are the little kind of little things you need to help yeah, motivate exactly, yeah. you. You're looking for something different. The yeah. goals, don't, I'm sure, will always motivate him. The medals. I don't know where that motivate him anymore. He's won so much. The money clearly that. isn't a motivator, I would have thought, at this yeah. stage, because he'll never be able to count how much money he's got. So you're looking for something different. So you take yeah. any minor thing as a slight. I don't know if either of you <laughs> had that in your oh, career. I, I agree, and I think that's what, that's been the difference in him. I always make the reference to him to say Wayne Rooney, similar types of age, similar-ish kind of expectations in and around that time when they are at Man United together at the start. He has devoted his life to being the best he can be. Now, there is off-the-field issues in terms of his promotional and he is a brand. But when we look at someone like Neymar last night, the the one that they were all talking about going in, more than Mbappe, more than Cavani, it's hearing stories about him having a two-, three-day birthday party, missing league cup games in, in France over it being a big issue in the dressing room for the wrong reason. And you've got someone like Ronaldo, who is the ultimate role model. Look, I've, I've been quite critical of Ronaldo. I don't particularly like him. Mm-hmm. As a fellow, I wouldn't like to go for a beer with him. He probably wouldn't be interested in going for a beer. So that's <laughs> story. Doesn't, doesn't drink. Anything. He wouldn't go for it. He probably a doesn't. He just probably mm. doesn't drink. Yeah, but he's the. But you're ultimate, right. I have the utmost respect for him from the very start. Like someone like Neymar, does he seem to be that devoted to his career? Do you think? Like sort of another Ronaldinho who has all the ability and, and won't. Will he be looking like Ronaldo at 33? Ronaldo takes his top off. He's still the. <laughs> he's still the you know top dog. He still looks like a guy who's putting every ounce of every minute of his life into being the best being the best condition being the best he can be to get the most out of his body and yeah I said I wouldn't you know I don't like him I don't particularly like his attitude on the pitch I don't particularly like a lot of things but yeah I, I would respect him massively to be still doing what he's doing at this yeah. age be still the top dog basically in, in staggering like some of his stats Kev are, are off the charts that's the seventh season in a row that he scored double figures in the Champions League it's his 116th goal in the Champions League it was 101st for Real Madrid. Mm, he's the first player to score 100 goals in the Champions League oh, for one club. Phenomenal. Like, like I, I don't think there's ever been a goal scorer like him. And he just plunders the goals with the with the. He didn't actually start as has. a striker. Yeah. Like he's played a lot of that time from the left or the right, whatever. It's only been now. Or like he probably should have been in the last two years, but for me, played as an out-and-out striker where he still drifts to the left. He still has certain times where he has to fill that fill that void. You have to put him in the air. Like He had a very quiet game last night. He really did. Neymar on the eye was all singing, all dancing, tricks, usual what we would, we would mm. assume. Had the opportunity. He got better possession, certainly in the first half, in and around Real Madrid's box, but he wasn't as effective. Whereas Ronaldo, bang, penalty, no doubt, bang it's only on the spot to finish the goal finishes it really well he hasn't been involved if you've watched the last few years he hasn't been involved really in much of the games the build up yeah he's just solely dedicated to himself yeah. to scoring goals he you know forget about picking up on the wing and beating a load of players like he used to or getting it getting it in the left back position and running up the pitch and cutting inside he just really dedicated himself to being nearly like a goal poacher now and he's finishing his, his conversion Stagger. rate must be unbelievable you know he doesn't Stagger. you don't see him miss too many mm. we and mentioned, if he does he doesn't care he just shoots again the next yeah. chance imagine maybe the benefit of West Brom knocking Liverpool out of the FA Cup obviously all the pressure in terms of La Liga is off Real Madrid there's no chance they're going to come remotely close to finishing first or second so they just need to make sure they finish in the top four that they're playing Champions League football next season and with that draw having been made two months ago that PSG game was targeted mm. I'd say that is all they have spoken about since the draw was made let everybody else write you off mm. prime yourself for that game Apparel. and we saw the real kick in the in the old team last night and suddenly you're thinking they get through this tie they're in the top two or three favourites to win what would it be their fourth and five seasons yeah. and go down as the greatest club team of all time mm. staggering staggering well listen we've got Kevin's studio so we'll 
chat to him a little bit now. We'll get on to Tuesday's Champions League action after that. I'm going to speak about Ryan Mason as well, obviously with Kevin in. But tell us how you've been getting on. You've been retired now a couple of months. I've done a little bit of work. We've spent a bit of time. Yeah. We haven't got a game of golf in yet, unfortunately. But the weather is starting to get better. Dave's coming with us as well. He's your boat going to spin down to Ross there? No the problem. Lads, yeah. Happily. Yeah. Dave, will you be allowed to get on? Well, once the temperature goes above 12 or 13 degrees, I'll consider Fair taking the clubs out of the shed. <laughs> so tell us what you've been up to. How have you been enjoying it or not enjoying it? Have you been missing it? Yeah, uh, Colorado started back pre-season a couple of weeks ago. And it's the first time, you know, I didn't think I'd ever look at a team doing pre-season or look from afar and miss it. And I've, you know, seen them. They're, they're off doing warm weather training in Arizona and different places. And the new signings and the excitement of, you know, seeing new signings going there. And, and yeah, that's my first time I've thought, oh... You know, a little pang to go back and, uh, you know, I'm glad I do. You know, it'd be something wrong, I think, if I didn't have a little yeah. bit of that, um, you know. but Especially with the way you had to retire, obviously. Yeah. It's different if, if your legs go or you feel yeah. bad enough where you are you were forced into yeah I know it was, I knew it was coming I'm 34 so you know, I know listen I've been planning you know I was going to play another year or two sort of and, and or whatever you know so that side of it it was it was a year or two earlier than I planned but at least I got I was 34 um, but it's just when I felt you know I feel now after taking five or six months you feel like you're fit as a fiddle I don't know what you were like you know once you finish all the niggles are gone you yeah, think Jesus feel fresh. yeah I feel fresh played five aside the last few weeks with my brother and a few of his uh, uh Teammates or old GA club mates were keeping themselves fit mm. before they go back uh, training for their for their club team. So, um, been a bit of fun doing that, and I've had the yeah the bug again, I suppose, which yeah, which I didn't have, you know, when I first stopped. How's it been back in Ireland? Because Wexford's slightly different to Colorado, yeah, where you've been for yeah, the last. Wexford's beautiful. Well. It's lovely. Um, you know, I've been in and out, and we've been we've been doing a bit of traveling stuff. I couldn't do. We went to visit my wife's sister in Australia, for example, which she's been living there seven years, and we haven't got to do that. So, um, you know, to be a the, the plus sides of, of, of not being you know involved in soccer to be able to do stuff like restricted. that restricted yeah I've been restricted and you're always planning you're, you're always thinking to when you have to if you're in the off season you're always thinking Maximize when I'm back for training time. how am I going to be fit how, yeah, how am I going to max yeah. I can't spend two weeks in Australia I've got to yeah. do this that and the other so um I'm still got that feeling. I still feel if I go for a pint in my local pub, I still feel guilty. I still haven't got rid of that. Um, You'll get over that. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I do, but uh, I still have that. Wake up in the morning, go, oh, shouldn't have been drinking or whatever, um, which which is still lingering. But um, to have that to have that freedom is is strange. To be able to, to be able to you know to plan stuff weeks and months in advance. We talk. We're talking about going to Augusta and things like that and going to different golf tournaments stuff I've never we're actually talking about we were, going to yeah. Augusta but um, a certain Stephen Hunt has let us down on that it was supposed to be a nice little trip away <laughs> get yourself <laughs> over to a bit of golf obviously go and watch yeah. the Master but Stephen Hunt's let us down so I'm glad we got that out there you're out there Stephen if you're watching we're not happy with Coming you for you. not <laughs> happy um, right I want to bring you right back okay so yeah. we spoke a little bit in the last few weeks about the National Leagues 15s, 17s, 19s yeah. introduced we would have a very different path. And I always say to young players that I've coached or chatted with, there's no set formula to having a career in football. So yeah. yours obviously was Pat Cork. Yeah. You make your way to, to Reading. Tell us a little bit about that. And did you think the opportunity may have passed you or? I was, no, I was very comfortable, you know, uh, going to St. Patrick's Athletic was a big deal for me, mm. you know, going from, from Wexford, no one, you know, if you're from Waterford, even however, you can see people, whether it was Hunty or John O'Shea, different people, there's always someone you could follow a route where like, no one from Wexford had really you know, become a professional soccer player um, when I was at that age. And so going to St. Pat's was a big thing for me. Um, you know, I wasn't thinking of across the water, I was thinking, I was just sorely thinking, can I get into St. Mm. Patrick's, St. Pat's at like starting 11? You know, I was 17 at the time, I just finished. Um, Finished secondary school. I'd been training them a little bit in my last year and going up on on weeks off and stuff to spend some time with them. But um, you know, I was I was not panicking. I was comfortable as I get in that team and sort of a stepping stone. That's the way I looked at it. I was never thinking I have to get to England by this age or that age. I thought get into a League of Ireland team and if I can do it there, well then you know my chance might come. And um, I moved from St Pat's down to Cork City. Um, I had different chances to go on trials when I was younger. I was fifteen, sixteen. For whatever reason, I was injured, or whatever, and I didn't get to do take up the opportunity. Um, so 17 years ago, Pat. Yeah, look at that. Has an age today. Yeah, oh, I don't know about that. Though. You've been very kind. <laughs> jersey fits well, doesn't it? Yeah, nice and baggy on you. Um, so that was a massive deal for me. That and and in my head, you know, that was the the biggest thing to play mm. for them. That was to get to that level. You know, I was playing with guys who would come back from England or playing the League of Ireland all their life, experienced people, and and I would, you know, people ask me now, parents, you know, they're 
their child is 14 what should he be doing this team in England wants him to train with him and fair enough you can come through that way obviously but I just don't think it's right for a 14 or 15 year old to be leaving mm. um, leaving your family in an ideal situation if you can if you see a route where you could stay in Ireland in a good coaching set up and, and get is the route better way. now though I would think so. Yeah. The setup, it, it's improving all the time. Every other trying to, yeah. If you can, now. especially League of Ireland team. I didn't have Wexford Utes. We had Wexford Utes, the actual Wexford Utes. Yeah. It was the underage team. And I was lucky with Mick Wallace, who put a lot of effort in to that, and you know, got us. We went to Italy on coaching camps and playing teams there. And without that, I would have definitely have drifted away. Yeah. That kept me going at that 15, 16, 17 years of age, and he got me the the chance to go to St Patrick's Lake. He became friendly with Pat Dolan. So, um, yeah, that was you know. A, this is a route that someone can't do now but you, Wexford Wexford now have an under 13s yeah. under 15s under 17s yeah. and you can see if I get an under 13s you can see that and yeah. they, oh, everyone's got good pitches good structure good coach and they all have to yeah. have those in place so why wouldn't you do that now if you can't make service able, if you can't make the, the grade at those levels and make the Wexford youth team there's no point in going you know well, I, I went at 15 and, yeah. and I look at some of the 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 kids and they are kids are young young men that I've coached in the last few years and I see them and I look and I think wow was I like that then or was I a bit more mature I, I don't know but it's a staggering age to go across to England isn't it 15 yeah, years of age you, you couldn't really imagine it in no other profession does it happen now and I mean homesickness is always something that we've read about in any of the ex-pros autobiographies over the years but when you say you didn't really have an inspiration there was no one from Wexford that had kind yeah. of trodden that path but it is clearly a pathway now because there are so many people <coughs> that you can hold up in, as an example Kevin just one of them and we, we've seen those photos of all the lads in the Republic yeah. of Ireland squad in their League of Ireland yeah. shirts so you're talking well beyond double figures now at this stage over the last 10 years and where they've got their grounding in the League of Ireland and as the years go by the coaching levels the training methods the levels of sophistication they're all improving so if anything, it's probably getting to the point where it's the better path. Yeah. Because when you were going over, the academy system was still heavily populated by English, yeah. Scots, Welsh and Irish. It's a story now. Whereas so. now you're really competing with the, the entire the world. world. Yeah. Yeah. Then it meant it moved into the foreign or the uh, European. continental European stage of things, but it's actually gone way beyond that now, hasn't it? These clubs have academies in South America, yeah. in Africa, in, in all over Asia. So it's so difficult not to get lost if you end up in the academy of a Premier League club. Maybe a bit more of an opportunity at championship level. But if you're going beyond championship level, surely you're better off. Mm at a Cork City or a Rowers at Dundalk then heading over to the Wigan Athletic Academy I example. think we'll see a lot more of that in the next you were like years. you were the exception to the rule you and other lads like you when you yeah. see the amount that are signed every oh. year and they get introduced to the first team players like the Irish lads would get introduced <coughs> me at Reading or Wolves yeah. or whatever but then you wouldn't see them again exactly. you know and, and yeah. their parents come and their players come and they see and think this is great and then they're put in with another 20 lads yeah. and one player a year maybe yeah. out of that group and the rest like if you had to come back to Ireland that age like how depressed would you be difficult yeah, you know, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible dynamic isn't it and you, you are you're thrown to one side and, and we've spoke about this in the last couple of weeks about the big academies and I think it's getting worse in terms of the Chelsea's and Man City's and the big big academies they're on huge money they're making these 16, 17, 18 year olds feel like Neymar's and then they just get thrown to one side so then imagine going from 10, 20, 30 grand a week to a grand a week at Akron and Stanley Where's your head? Hang on a minute. Where's that driver? What time is he collecting me? At? Mm. Well, I'm sorry, you've got to, you've got to make your own way. You've got to get the bus. You've got to, you've got to do your own washing. You've got to clean your own boots. Pay your own ESP bill. Yeah, but it just messes their head up. And we've seen it time and time again. So tell me, then you go to Reading. How yeah. exciting of an opportunity for that w was you? Yeah, that was. You know, I they'd come and scout with me a few times at Cork. I was doing really well at Cork, and then a few different teams were sort of thinking of making an offer signing me and Reading went in and paid the money out of buyout clause and signed me and you know this was my first chance everyone you know when I was doing well in England or in the League of Ireland when are you going to England do you, do you want to go to England and it's sort of a big obviously big deal it's all you ever hear you need to go to England and so then the opportunity came to, to go to Reading I went I was very lucky lovely place to live a very family club that side of it um, and they weren't they were big and had a lovely stadium training, but they weren't big enough where, you know, I was being signed to sort of either be a sub or play, you know, I wasn't being signed. Straight into yeah, it. Yeah, straight into it. So, and, um, you know, it was a, in my head, it was, you know, I can't say, can I say shit or bust? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can say shit or bust. <laughs> you have now. Um, yeah, I've said it now. <laughs> so it was, I, I gave myself, you have no choice, you yeah. know, there is no failure, you know, you have to No make option. It. Yeah, it was no option. You, you did, I had a two-year contract and, 
you know, I knew if I didn't hit the ground running, that was it. Reading, they hadn't paid much for me. It was just, you know, they'd forget yeah. about me. So, so I, you were aware even then that you had a great opportunity, but yeah. you were just a number. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. And I was coming there as a no one. I was sort of a, a big player at Cork and doing well in the League of Ireland, but I was going there now as, like, the lads would never have heard of me, didn't even know about the League of Ireland, yeah. didn't know if we were part-time or full-time or what is it, just signing for them and they had no expectations. The other players... But um, we, you know, I, w- I did a real. I was fit going into preseason because I come from League and I had a really good preseason. Scored how a lot how of goals. soon did you realise whether it was ten minutes into your first session oh. or ten weeks into your time there? How soon did you have this realisation? Do you know what I actually? I'm able to contend yeah. with these boys. I'm, I'm not out of my depth here at all. I would say it was our first preseason game. Um, we played a team called. I think it was either Staines Athletic or Ditcott, one or the other, which was small um non league. Yeah, non league team. And I was I think I scored a hat trick and we won five nil or something. And I was like standout player and then we went to Sweden on pre season and I got a little mini competition or tournament and scored a load of goals and was given man the match in a few of the games and stuff like that by the local Sweden people handing me a trophy. It's like, Jesus, I'm like doing well here. Um, but I didn't expect to start the season. I didn't. It was Dave Kitson and Leroy Lee who spent a, they'd spent a lot of money on Leroy Lee and Dave Kitson was the top scorer in the championship the previous couple of years. So um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't thinking I was going to play immediately. I had thought get into the team in three or four months or whatever and hope get on the get on from the bench. But they got injured after two or three games. Um, that was the window of opportunity. Yeah, Dave Kitson uh, was it Leroy? It was Dave Kitson first actually came off injured against Burnley. Um, and I came on and scored and we won um, and I didn't I didn't miss a game then probably unless I was injured I didn't miss a game at Reading for four years um, apart from being rested for maybe a cup game or something but that was I under Steve Koppel under Steve Koppel yeah and when Dave Kitson I got in the team and I scored we scored that night we played Coventry the next week scored against Coventry we played Crystal Palace who'd just been relegated so these were a Premier League team Andy Johnson Clinton Morrison was yeah, playing that yeah. night so they were big players for me yeah. at the time well they were big players but in my head, oh, this yeah. was like, this is a game where if I can play well in this game, and I think I, I scored a worldly in that game, um, dribbled from the halfway line and scored from outside the box and then won a penalty and I think set up a goal and we won 4-3 or something. It was a mad game. Um, and then that's when I first, that, after that game, Brian Kerr was at that game um, and came up and chatted to me afterwards and I, you know, he's like, this how thing. quick though is that for, to go from core yeah. opportunity quite quickly? We yeah. all had to have the opportunity by yeah. someone either being injured or suspended or someone's in the team and they come out, yeah. and then the oil manager's there. Yeah, it's get that opportunity it was, off the back. Yeah, it was, it was really like I was totally, I don't know what you'd call it, I was, um, freaked out by it, I suppose. Yeah. It was like all of a sudden the oil manager's talking to me. I didn't know Brian Kerr. I hadn't played. I'd been called into his underage panels, but he left then um, to be the Ireland manager. So I never really played under him. I played on him for one game, maybe. So he came and he he uh, that was it. Um, the next squad's in a month or two. Keep it up or whatever. And I stayed in the team and I kept scoring. Um, you know, scored a cup, scored a, maybe two in a game, scored a hat trick or whatever. And in the next Ireland squad, it was the um, the last games of Brian Kerr's campaign was against. We went to Cyprus away, I think, and Switzerland, and I was calling to the squad, and I remember I was bricking it. Um, <laughs> the one really was it was the team, the basically the same squad who'd been to the World Cup. The Kenny Cunt, Kenny was there. Was Kenny Taylor. in the squad. Yeah, oh, Kenny was captain. Um, Robbie, obviously, and Damien Duff, who were superstars. Damien Duff was at Chelsea at the time. Robbie Roy, Roy, was Roy in the Roy squad? Roy was, was in the squad, but he pulled out injured. Then um, I think he turned up for a day, maybe pulled out injured. I can't remember, but. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was going into that, and I was the sort of young player. It was, um, you know, they were all, these were all men. And these, yeah. were, this, this isn't you being called in for a friendly, and we'll have a look no, at you. Like yeah, these are make is, yeah. or break what World Cup qualifiers. Yeah. Like, this was, this is what ultimately broke yeah. Brian Kerr's tenure as as Ireland manager. So I was and like, pressure yeah. environment. I was. I remember I had a big bonus on my Reading contract if I got a guy into this. Nice to see you focus. <laughs> <laughs> like I needed to get on the pitch. So I was like, get on the pitch, but. Um, you know, it was um, it was mad, and again, it wasn't. You know, now it was weird now because they, they could name a forty man squad now. This was the twenty, the eighteen or the twenty two. Yeah. That was it. There was no like, you know, cutting the squad down or anything. It was mm. twenty two. You go and that's it. So you know, Zuna. Who the strikers in that squad? Can you remember? Obviously, Robbie, Robbie, me, Clinton, Clinton Morrison, and Stephen Elliott. Um, yeah, yeah. It was, was us. At Sunderland maybe at the time. He was at Sunderland at the time. Yeah. Um, so like all all heroes, all legends in my eyes, and they are, and and but I was you know so in the space that was October. So I joined Reading in June, 
got my first start in August and but but we were you know people I, I see people now would give out about a player get called up but we were top of the league in the championship and I was scoring I was the top scorer in the championship probably so you know it was probably I had no did no choice but call me up I was I was sort of on form and it would have been weird if I wasn't but um it was it was quick and I was yeah I was uh he was right not to play me because I did would've. you find that a big jump going yeah, from Reading? Did I you? Did. More psychologically, the, right. that's the you know we're playing the champion, we're playing Reading, a good player. So the training probably wasn't a whole lot. The standard yeah, is the similar. Standard wouldn't have been. It would have been a little better with Ireland. Just but the enormity of it. Yeah, 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 like you said. So now when I, when I see people when a player maybe other players are different, but when a new player gets brought in, you know there was new players get brought in uh, this year and people say oh they should play straight away I, I would be more of the I don't know what their psychology is but I would be more get them in a couple of squads first and integrate squads. them and get them yeah. settled because it's it is a massive leap I don't know if younger players now don't really see this as a massive leap as much but to me that was you know we've been in squad. squads together and yeah. I won't name any names because I wouldn't want to embarrass <laughs> them but we've seen players come into the squad where you know they've settled like snow yeah, yeah. 19, 20 years of age strolling around <laughs> the place with the yeah. earrings caps whatever it might be one particular trip <laughs> there was one player handing out invites to his 21st birthday party during the actual international trip which was just <laughs> beggar to leave was that a no no or something huh? <clears throat> you, he, what he hadn't been in and around you guys long enough for a squad that. right so he never met half these guys exactly he's, he's bouncing around, around with invites to his 21st during the actual break I didn't I couldn't make it unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. you'll hear Seymour even, even at club level or like I, with that Ireland squad I just sat there and said nothing you know and, and same at club <laughs> level. You didn't say much you got hold it. <laughs> Too busy sleeping. But uh, go club level, whatever club, but no matter what age, you go in first year, you're quiet and you sit there and you get the light of land and you figure things out, especially when you're younger. But now that just doesn't seem to be... And like younger people seem more confident or more... Maybe maybe it's the same, I don't know, maybe it's just a show to put on. So when did you feel like, okay, I'm an island player, I belong here, I, I, I deserve to be here. Maybe you did feel like you deserved to be no, there then, but uh, where did you feel like... I'm part of the future. Yeah, when I f when did I first feel? Does I understand? Yeah, it would have been. It would have been. I tell you what, we went to. We played a few games. Understand, but even then, you know, still my first few caps. Still, I would have been really nervous and a good nervous though. I, I'd like to be nervous, yeah. um, but I didn't play well for Ireland. In my first few games, I was still settling in. I think the start of the next qualifying we started I got my first goal against San Marino and, and I got a call we played Slovakia at home actually and I scored a, a really good header, header wasn't yeah. it? at Croke Park at Croke Park yeah, yeah. And, and that's when I sort of you know I'm, st I'm after starting a few games in a row here competitive and and then we were at Reading in the Premier League and I think we were flying it as well so like looking back at it now you know I shouldn't have felt as maybe nervous as I did I don't know or as taking as long to settle in but I did I felt it took me and I remember being told it'll take 10 or 15 games and it did take me 10 or 15 games because as well that group it wouldn't be like I think now when players come in the group is so it's, it's going to be such a turnover now whereas mm -hmm. when I came into a settled group and they all had their you know their habits and their friends and their clique they'd all been to the World Cup and previous together so I was coming in and trying to integrate and break into that a little bit and it was I found it tough to begin with Well certainly one reign where you were hugely integral was when I played on the trap you must have felt so important to the way we played yeah. under him look there's been a lot of talk <laughs> about the style of play certain yeah. players will feel aggrieved that they, they didn't get more caps yeah. because he fairly set, set in stone wasn't at starting line up you know we come mm. we come now under Martin and we're trying to guess systems and personnel it's very very difficult with trap it must have been an absolute dream Dave it's just we knew who if whoever was fit that was the, the team and you were crucial to the yeah, way it was a dream played. for us because we knew Tuesday evening yeah. what, what the team yeah. was. Well, it was good as a player if you were in the team. You know, I really enjoyed it. You, you, but you'd make maybe one or two changes. Sticking across in there. Yeah. He was really nice to me. You know, he's he'd always have a smile and a twinkle in his eye when I turn up. He'd always be, Kevin, relax. You're, you're tired. You've run a lot. Relax. You know, it'd be like whispering to me the whole time. You know, you need. You look tired or take a break don't train today or you know he'd always yeah, have I was a, telling the opposite to me yeah. <laughs> run, run he'd always have a word with me because I did run a lot under he yeah. probably knew I needed to, to calm it down during the week in training but he always had a, he, I always felt he you know had a word for me or a, you know a smile for me and um, you know he, he played me an awful lot um, in the end he didn't play me so much but um, you know I probably didn't deserve to be either so but for a long time you know our style wouldn't have been the prettiest but we knew what we were doing we we had a plan we stuck to it we practiced it all week you know it mightn't have been the prettiest but we knew what we were doing you know we were going along a, a lot of the time or from kickouts but we were all on the same page I think um, 
You know so I mean? were you were they enjoyable games to play in? Obviously, any game you win yeah. is enjoyable, but in general terms, when pretty much you're not. In, on one level, he's playing to your strengths yeah. because he knows you can do that kind of a job. But we rarely got to see your footballing skills no. to the same extent that we would see when you were leading the line for Reading when you were wearing a green shirt. Yeah. I just saw you as the guy that was leaving the field after 87 <laughs> minutes with your like, legs on stumps. I would I mean, be, was uh, that enjoyable? I would be rolled off. Those games were on a Wednesday as well and we'd have a club game on a Saturday and it was <laughs> so hard to come to, to get back around so quickly. Um, but at the time... You know, I didn't think it was enjoyable. I was playing for Ireland. Giovanni Trapattoni was my manager, like an absolute legend. So I was just happy, you know, happy to play. And, and we were getting good results. And you could see we were, you know, you, you could see that we were, you know, I'd played under, obviously, the previous campaign under Steve Staunton. And it didn't work out. And we were tailed off early. And we were never in line. With, and we mm. tried to play better football. And we were never anywhere. So with, with, with uh, Giovanni, we were, you know, first or second in the group and we there was a buzz around the you place. You'd do anything he'd, he'd yeah, ask of you, basically. You basically. Yeah. He had that ability to get me to, yeah, so do you, you know. For the majority of us, I, I would say, I or people might say, I looked at him and rose in the glass because he was the one that gave me the opportunity. You would have played under yeah. a few Ireland managers, but he he had Damien Duff doing it. You know, he, he, not so much Robbie because Robbie was the, the one who probably got away with a little bit more in terms of, he got. He was always at the end of things and got yeah. that goal or whatever. But the rest of us, literally, would run through brick walls yeah. because you were playing though. Yeah, yeah. Like we for playing. guys who are being expected to turn over the squads, but no, come Tuesday afternoon, I for Saturday difficult. afternoon game, they weren't in the team. I've, I've got the like, utmost what, how, what, What's their opinion of trap? Yeah, it probably wouldn't be as good. Yeah, and I and I have got sympathy for those type of players that would turn up time and time again like some of the ones that would reel up my, in my head would be Paul McShane and Kevin Foley Andy Kyo those type of players who would turn up every single time to be part of it knowing that they might get some minutes but they don't even get a chance to impress in training like that would be my problem with it mm. you don't arrive thinking yeah mm. as as of arriving in Port Marnock or Castanock or wherever it might have been I'm on the fringe of it but I, if I really perform well Monday, Tuesday give the manager something to think about maybe Wednesday you never know it might at least be first sub mm. Tuesday evening you're gone I found that in, in under a lot of well, all managers international football is you know it does there's three or four days training it doesn't matter what you do in those unless you're carrying an injury or you might be trying to get okay, regardless of when the yeah, team is it's named it's very it's very based on your club form and previous games for Ireland. You know that he's he's not looking at you on a Monday. Most of the time on a Monday Tuesday, a lot of lads are sitting out. They've got niggles from their club, yeah. so they're not. You're not really. You're just getting there to be fit and to get in a little bit of shape for. So you can't. You can't. I don't know. Maybe you're different. You found it different. I don't think you're. Mm. You're really there to show what you can do in those <laughs> three or four days. Ask you this: We've had a text in a tweet in <laughs> from your mate, one of your heroes. <laughs> is it true? Clinton Morrison is your best strike man. Yeah. Nah. Me and Funny, um, it's from Clinton Morrison. How are yeah. you, Clinton? <laughs> I really enjoyed uh, coming in. Clinton was the one guy who was, well, they were all nice to me, but Clinton was good fun when I came in and friendly and, you know, um, easy to talk to for me. Um, and I remember the, we were talking about the Brian Kerr game. That game was at home to Switzerland, was his final game. Mm. We had to win. And it was me, Clinton, and Gary Dotterty on the bench. And Gary Dotterty had done well for Ireland coming on as a striker yeah, very well. and, yeah, and scoring some goals. But it was me, Clinton, and Gary, and we needed a goal. And Brian turned around and said, Doc, you're on, and put a man up front. <laughs> and Clinton was sitting there beside me. <laughs> when a goal was needed, he left the two strikers on and brought on the centre half to put him up front. And um, I always remember Clinton's reaction. He was, you know, it was, so, it was hilarious, but he was fuming. <laughs> but because it was my first squad, I was just like happy to be there. And I was just sitting there, I was grand, but Clinton, Clinton was going through the roof. It was, uh, it was funny to see in such a, a pressure situation as well. And you could see, you could tell, you know, he was deserved to be, to be. Uh, Right, <laughs> really pissed off about it's it. Like character. Yeah. Clinton, thanks for getting in touch. Appreciate that. Um, right, wind on Euro 2012. You're a key component in it. It was the highlight of my career in terms of getting there. But what a disaster it was. And it certainly doesn't sit well with me. I don't particularly like talking about it. It was obviously won't go down in history as one of our no. greatest tournaments. Um, just sheer regret is what I feel in terms of the build up, the monotony of it, um, obviously the results. How does it sit with you a few years on? It's, you know, it's the first time an Irish team's qualified for Euros for so long, so yeah. it should have been, a, you know, it's looked on as more successful, but our performances out there now, it's looked on as a nearly a joke. You know, people talk about it as, you know, and 
it's such a disappointment. Um, and you know, as my one major tournament, your major tournament, we missed out on the the World Cup previous to that. You know, um, right at the end in in the France game. Um, so, you know, I look back on it. The monotony in the build up. I expected that. You know, I expected the weeks together and that. That doesn't. You know me. I'm happy to sleep in a hotel room during the <laughs> afternoon, and I can get over that. That side of it was just my job. And you're get ready for the Euros, and this is what it is. This build up and this spell together. Um, but you know the the performance. You know, I didn't mind that if we put in the performance. That first game, the Italy game and the Spain game, they were in, they were two teams who were playing well at the yeah. time. And you think we're in we're under pressure Especially here Spain. anyway. Yeah, we're not. This group is d- difficult, but we need to put in a performance against Croatia. And we were just. I thought after all that build up and and disappointed with my own performance. I'm not talking. About, I'm not giving out about everyone else, but my own performance was pretty very average and not not what I wanted. And you know, just looking at the whole thing, and as they say. You know, just lots of little things weren't quite right, and they all built up to become big things, big issues. I remember, you know, spoke about but the day before that game, and everyone's trying to rearrange where their girl. Just stupid things that shouldn't be. We shouldn't have ever been thinking about talking about or complaining about it. It shouldn't have been trying to rearrange what where our girlfriends were staying and wives were staying. How was that an issue the day before the game? Because well, they are, they only arrived the day before the game, so right. we didn't. The, the, the hotel they were in, I remember, was. Was it above a <laughs> was it above a lap dancing club or something like that? And uh, all it's of a sudden, its benefits yeah. obviously. <laughs> like you're grand. <laughs> we were getting phone calls the day before. Well, uh, you know, this Kevin or all of us. My, I, mine was leaving me alone. I think she was sorting out for herself. But lads were getting a bit of stick about that. But it isn't an issue. It can be dealt with. It's fine. But, but it's a need is distraction. Yeah, that, that you would imagine the Croatian yeah. players didn't have to deal with. Yeah, it becomes an issue when you're together and stuff is niggling at you when you're together for so long everything I've you said know, that before yeah. about with, with like we, we genuinely got on didn't we and it's probably, yeah. probably the case in all the Ireland squads you've been in I presume but that group really really mm. got on well so it's not like you hear the England teams in the past the egos the, no. the north-south divide that was never the case with us but by the end of it I think we were doing each other's heads in Yeah, we really were it went on that long and Kev's mentioned the little things just so who's escalated. whose fault was all of that? Well, it can't be the players' fault, and I've thought about this a lot since I've retired, since that tournament, because you were saying about the monotony, and we expected that, we expected the same training. They should have thought about that. The experts should have thought about that, the the management team, the, the sports science department, all that medical, because they should have anticipated long, hard season with Steve McLaren on the show last week talking about England 2002 World Cup first half amazing against Brazil then they just looked shattered they were gone because of the season they had um, so they should have known the type of training we did our training sessions were full on weren't they, yeah, they were. it wasn't like you know an Italian type training session where they can go through the motions mm. if players weren't putting it in our training session you'd be on them you know because we trained how we played and they would have to curtail maybe the times or should have curtailed yeah. the times or there should have been more downtime. Um, and so were these misgivings, doubts expressed to, was there a leadership group within the squad that you could discuss it as a group and then speak to the management? I think, you know what, a big loss, I don't, Liam Brady wasn't there then and I felt yeah. he was he was really good go-between to be able to go and speak and he, obviously fluent Italian, was able to go, you know, Trapattoni took him, took what he said from us and, and when he yeah, left, respected him, yeah, he respected him and would take it on board. I think when he left, we lost, we lost that bridge or that link to be able to you know, I felt I liked Marco Tardelli, but I don't think he would take on board no. what you were telling him. You know, he was. And so, when you've lost to Croatia and Italy, and you know that no matter what happens in the Spain game, you're out. Yeah. Are you guys already mentally on the on the on your holidays in the build up to the Spanish game? Like you can't wait to get out of there. Oh, the Italian game. Last, Sorry, the Italian Spain game. Yeah, you know you're out. We know we're out. Yeah. So, are you have have guys checked out mentally already? I think it was very tough. It was a tough couple of days. It was. It was. It was for me. It'd be. It, it had been a downer, and this is really sad to say. Even before a ball was kicked, because of the atmosphere that had In been. In the first game. Yeah, I remember. I was rooming with Wardy, Stephen Ward, and this one talking about in terms. Of, I I really like Wardy. Got on well. Room together for a couple of years. We had to just go in separate rooms because we're just niggling it was he snores the whole time he does actually. snore yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> nozzle on him <laughs> I remember having to just just needed my own space and I remember going and like getting videos of friends to send me bits and bobs and pictures from my home to try and get myself into a fan's frame of mind mm. and away from being a player 
because the player side of it and the training and around the hotel was getting it was getting me that bogged down and kind of anxious and I, I don't know it was just was that feeling throughout the squad did you yeah, have that feeling I, as well I, or is it just he doesn't really get on with anyone yeah he, he was snapping early doors in that <laughs> squad he had a great row with Alan Kelly one day on the bus <laughs> <laughs> what was that over <laughs> Go ahead. I don't even remember. It was just good fun seeing him See, snapping. Uh, he's, pre- he's presenting the show. He's not supposed to be having. I know, to tell I'm supposed stories. to be uh, controlling. But I'll, I'll <laughs> say it did sum up. And I, I think if recollection serves me right, it was the day before the, the evening before the training session on the pitch. Yeah, the it, was, it was the stadium, wasn't actually, it? Yeah. Before the Croatia game, and I don't know whether it was to do with taxis to and from stadiums because Kells by that stage, Alan Kelly, who was a great fella, who should mention. Um, he was the one going, being the goal between trying to sort bits and bobs out. So I can imagine the role he had. He was up to 90. And I'm sure it was about lifts for families from the hotels or whatever. And whatever, something happened. And it just kicked off a little bit down the back of the bus between myself and Kells, which was very strange because we got on very well before. We got on very well literally after. But it just summed up the kind of frustration and I think that had built up. Speaking to lads after the last Euros, who were at boat it was a lot the preparation the where they stayed hotel wise everything was a lot more organised I suppose they learned a lesson yeah. uh, people you know you, we hadn't they hadn't been to a tournament in a, you know, in a while so the people who were that's working that's not and good enough and that's unforgivable it doesn't matter if you haven't been to a tournament you are part of a footballing family where there's endless amounts of information you can pick up the phone to the FA mm. and pick their brains they've been to every tournament bar one or two for the last 25, 30 years what are the pitfalls what should we be looking out for speak to guys who are involved in the logistics around Japan and Korea around Euro 88 USA 94 Italian 90 there's so many people they could speak to to ensure that this did not happen yeah, the, my one was the the frustrating thing for me was the hotel we were, we were talking about earlier just so the thing when you're with internationals that to pass the time during the day you go you have coffees you walk out of hotel you go ever but where we were it was a lovely hotel and I think one side was oh we'll have a hotel in the city because the lads would be able to walk out and have coffees but obviously we couldn't we couldn't do that we were on lockdown our our hotel was surrounded by it seemed like hundreds of Irish fans you couldn't go out on your balcony you couldn't open the door of your hotel room it was um, to look out to look out because there was people down below all chatting up Irish songs and this was going on into the middle uh, of the night it was, it was, it was staggering it really was like yeah. we'd open the lift to go to training and it was like walking out into the biggest stag do you've ever seen in your life <laughs> wasn't it staggering yeah. like really to, you're right we couldn't go anywhere some of the families were about 700 yards away in that other hotel do you remember down yeah. the beach I remember having to put like camouflage on hats <laughs> in the middle of, middle of June hats everything on different tracksuits and just kind of slope out the back way run down the beach to try and see your family just for to it get was that stre- it was stressful you know you shouldn't be you should be relaxing hotel. this was just stressful you couldn't it felt like you couldn't breathe I know they've in this year, it was top class where they stayed in Versailles and the lads could wander around, they could go wherever they wanted and, and get a bit of fresh air, get out of your hotel room, not have to see your teammates 24-7. Little things, and it sounds like we're, well, we are making excuses and, and coming up with reasons for why, but you have to find reasons and they're the, the ones I can can think of, you know. Um, you know, we we were getting, you know, looking aside from all that, as a group, we were reaching the end as age-wise. Yeah. A lot of, you know, we were coming to the end, end of, of the you, know, a lot of, lot you know, of players. two years earlier was our peak, I think. Um, the 2010 we, yeah, World Cup. If we'd have got to that World Cup, I felt we would have had a bitter impact. And, you know, listen, at the end of the day, we had Spain, Italy and Croatia in the group. You know, we, we should have put up a better performance in all of those games. It was, it was going to be a big ass no matter, even if we did play to our best to, to get through. We spoke about regrets um, in terms of that tournament. What about club level? So, go back to Wolves, and you fly in there, mm. and there's a bit of interest for some big clubs. Arsenal, Juve reported. Firstly, were they were they in the equation, or what? What clubs? Because you, you can tell us now. You're retired. Um, the Juve one, I don't know anything about. The Arsenal one, there was um, interest. I remember earlier on, actually, Martin O'Neill tried to sign me a couple of times for Aston Villa. Um, were, were, was this after Wolves had been relegated from the Premier League? Um, while you were still in that division? While I was still at Wolves. Uh, while we were still in the Premier League. Um, no, it wasn't after we'd been relegated. After your four Nearly went to Celtic a few times. You know, different things. You can't even think of all the different clubs at different yeah. times. Very but then he didn't really kind of grab you and. and no, just. They were like really linked yeah. with Juve, Arsenal. Well, I never got. It was never came to. I remember Mick McCarthy calling me into a room. Um, pre-season my second pre-season at Wolves and just saying listen Kevin 
you're not going anywhere. You've got two or three years left in your contract. You know, there's a bit of interest in you or whatever, from, but we want you here and that's it. Mm. We'll give you a new contract. You know, we'll we'll match whatever you might get. That sort of, you know, you're, but you're not going anywhere. Simple as that. And we had a, you know, Steve Morgan was a very rich owner. He didn't need the money. You know, it wasn't like a club. It wasn't a club who sold players in that era yeah. unless they had to. When they got relegated, they did. Um, but at the time, it was, you're not going anywhere. And, uh, so and I'm that really type of person, you know, I'm not that type of person to, I really like Mick McCarthy, I really like Wolves, they signed me and spent a lot of money on me and um, I respected that and I liked the plans they had and I, you know, I felt I owed it to them at the time as well. But, you know, I would have loved to have gone to some of those teams mentioned, obviously, but it wasn't, you know, I just, it never got to a stage where, especially at Wolves, um, I remember at Reading, uh, on transfer day, <laughs> deadline day, I get, I get in a call actually to go to Spurs on transfer deadline they're like Kevin we, we can't get through to your club they've all turned off their phones they just sold uh, Berbatov to um, to United to United and yeah. they were desperate to get someone in and I was at Reading doing well um, it was the uh, y'all who was the manager I don't even know the manager know, it wasn't the manager it was behind the scenes who were ringing and I got a phone call and can you get in contact with them we did obviously looking for a centre I think I don't what know did who you do there then because I'm telling you right now I'm doing a Peter Rod and Wingy yeah. I am driving down I was in I was in, and I was in Wexford oh, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> we'd been given a couple of days off right. and the club Steve Coppel had told everyone at, on purpose uh, he gave yeah. you those days off yeah. obviously because it felt yeah, nice yeah, yeah. he he told everyone at Reading to shut their phone off once he really once the day before had gone he said there's no one coming or leaving was the manager just um, yeah, he told them to uh, turn your phones off another one I remember uh, at Reading I was told, uh, given a figure, I can't. It was maybe eight million or nine. I can't. Eight or nine million. You can, you can leave for if if Kevin that valuation is yeah, met, yeah. and it was met by I think it was Aston Villa met the valuation, and then and they moved the goalpost, and they said no. We said above that figure. We didn't say that figure. So you know stuff like that. But I don't actually have you know. I I enjoyed my career. So yeah. as you know, maybe it would have been things would have gone crap wherever things might have gone really well wherever. But I enjoyed. I enjoyed my time at Wolves. No regrets in terms of not. Pushing maybe one of those, you know, I could have, but I'm just that's not me. So yeah. you know, if, if just the way it is, I going to Celtic would have been good. You know, it'd have been great to play for Celtic maybe for a year to experience that. Everyone says it's amazing, but I went to QPR I think instead on loan. Um, Celtic were trying to sign me permanently and uh, they couldn't come up with a package yeah. or whatever fee that suited Wolves. But I went and loaned to QPR and I really enjoyed that. We we got promoted. I really enjoyed it. it went really well first five or six games and then I tore my medial ligament and so people look I think now and say oh you didn't have a successful time at QPR you did, but I did really I started in the team really loved yeah. it it was great it was a different totally different experience to being at Wolves QPR was this yeah. random stuff going on at QPR at the time I ended up as a manager and we did different players in and out of the team just <laughs> and they were all good guys it was a great little weird setup. Yeah. Um, but I tore my medial and I got back just in time for the playoffs I worked my nuts off to get my medial right for the to get into the playoffs and I got back in the team for the playoffs so I only played a handful of games in the end but I really enjoyed that was the Bobby Zamora one was it yeah, yeah, yeah. and we got we played Derby, uh, Derby and, and we probably had about 15% possession against Derby they should have won yeah. Yeah. yeah it was and we nicked it, it in the last mainly, I don't oh, it, was, it was we felt no we were obviously brilliant and all but we all felt we were going up and shaking hands with the Derby players saying listen Richard Kyo I know unfortunately, I yeah, what is the playoff um, championship playoff final like to play in because the build up to it it's always been branded as the richest game in football like there is no other game on which there is more riding financially yeah. but that's really from the club's point of view isn't it because a lot of the players who win a playoff medal they probably won't be playing in the Premier League yeah. such as the turnover yeah, when a club goes is, up yeah. from the Championship so it probably doesn't make an awful lot of odds to you in that regard or is it just another oh, game no, it is it, it was it was my first playoff final I'd been in the playoffs with Reading um, but it was my first final and it I yeah, know it meant a lot to me that the, the I hadn't played at Wembley, so walking out and to see the the noise, I wasn't expecting the noise and the atmosphere on the day. And all of a sudden, I was like, "Ooh, this is a big game!" You know, um, I was only on loan, so you know, I knew I was going back to mm. to Wolves. I don't know the other players what their experience was, but most of them stayed there. And, and you know, whether it's lads never played in the Premier League or lads' contracts might double, you don't know what each person's situation is financially or whatever. It's you know, and it's the playoff. It's been watched every well in a lot of places, and um, you know that. The difference in the joy on our—I know that's after every big game—but you could really see after this the difference in the joy on our 
faces and, and the Derby lads were just devastated they wrote off yeah, devastated that remember. affected them for a couple of years yeah they didn't come no. right after that because they should have yeah, they, they were the best good squad. team we played against yeah. that year they I were agree. really good yeah. um, they beat us in the semis actually yeah, yeah. right in there I thought was, they were top notch so they were just um, wrote off we had like our owners to see it, our faces afterwards <laughs> I've seen owners so happy because I think QPR were financially Absolutely quite under it. pressure yeah. they needed that <laughs> and they were they were joyous in the dressing room afterwards as you got older, so I was thinking about this earlier, what, what I wanted to ask you about in particular. So as I got older in terms of motivation, my motivation was always to, to play for Ireland. So at club level, I would try and get a move or go to a club where I'd be in the best possible position, playing well to be in contention for Ireland. Yeah. What, what was it for you? <sighs> Moves, if I was to move somewhere. Yeah, no, just that motivation in terms my of motivation, as you get older. Yeah, my motivation was fear of failure um this i think you know as i said i said it to you when i moved to reading it was a fear of having to go home with my mm. tail between my legs you know that that was my i don't think i played as well when i lost that fear i didn't my form when when i was you know when i was after making my Ireland playing loads of times you know when i lost that adrenaline from that fear when i thought you know, when it got to the stage where if it went tits up, it didn't really, you know, yeah. if I, if, you know, it didn't matter as much then because I'd done what I'd set out to do sort of thing. You know, I never dreamed of winning Premier League. I dreamed of being a professional yeah. soccer player and snap, you know, yeah. you know, that was so when, then I, when you get, so when I got to a level where the Ireland equation was taken away from me, yeah, I didn't realise it at the time, but my hunger dwindled, I think. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah, I did. You know, the, the, the. It wasn't just playing for Ireland, but it was everything, you know, when 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 I rely when I suppose, you know, it's everything that goes with playing soccer in the Premier League and you get paid more money and everything, you you don't think it's happening, but so little things you wouldn't have done. You know, my my diet might have only dropped a percentage, you know, my fitness levels might have only dropped a percentage, but it was a difference between me being a very, very good player to being just a good player I suppose or whatever you know that, that little percentage made Do you realise it at the time or is it only in hindsight that your in, kind in of standards are yeah, just dropping a know, little bit uh, yeah you know and, and for me to keep my standards high was fear that's what kept my standards high that's what kept me going nuts training in the off season when other lads would be not doing anything I'd be running on the beach or I'd be doing crazy stuff I remember hunting one year pushing cars up hills and stuff you know, <laughs> that, yeah you can imagine <laughs> so that was the fear I was fear of being last in the fitness training fear of ever, fear of not being picked fear of coming home to Ireland fear of going broke financially you know all those things when when I got to 28 or 29 all of a sudden and, you're, and that you know those things you've done you've played for Ireland that, you know I wanted to get to 50 caps I got to 50 caps all those things you mark off and you think the fear sort of you know dissipates and you don't that was my motivation and you'd lose a bit of I still listen I was still training hard I was still living my life I would say a lot better than most professionals but I wasn't the standards that I had I had really high standards that, you know whether it was going out or whether it was having a beer or not, I was quite boring for a long time in regarding to other players. I would imagine I would not go out. I would, you know, be so dedicated and I'd let it slip. I, you know, mm. it mightn't have made any difference, but in my head it made a difference. That beer or two that I might have never had, or that glass of wine with dinner that I wouldn't have had, I, I probably started to have when I was, you know, not not, you know, not much at all. But in my head, that was my standard slipping a bit. We've got a text in from Carl. Um, can you ask Kevin how he compares Ireland's current striker situation as to when he started out? Where do you see it right now? We're at that cha crossroads. You know, when I first started, so it was me, Clinton, Robbie, Stephen Elliott, and very soon after, Shane Long and Darren Murphy and Jonathan Walters. And it basically stayed that group till now. You know, um, Simon Cox coming in and out and Andy Kyo coming in and out. He was playing on the wing more. But, yeah. you know, that group has gone through 10 years or... And there's no, you know, we were the 21-year-olds and 22-year-olds. We were playing in the Premier League. All of us then are at the Championship and all doing well and scoring goals. And you don't see, you know, we, we looking back now, we were really lucky to have... Dave mentioned know. there about the, the competitiveness now of, you know, too much is made. Oh, we haven't got players playing in the top six, top eight teams. But that's just the way it's gone. It's mm -hmm. a bit of a knock-on effect for the, the England national team. We we haven't, but players playing yeah. in the Premier League and top championship is still a very, very yeah, good level. Yeah, it is. Um, and we just we don't seem to have that group of three or four like we had. Um, you know, Maybe we're looking back at rose tinted glasses or something, but right now it's a changeover. We've got a few coming through. Um, and it's up, you know, they haven't gone and played yet and you know, taken their chance, but their chance is coming now because that, it's that switch over time. And 
we need a couple, not just one. We need a few. You know, we'd Robbie Keane relying on Robbie, and then we'd he'd have a partner over the years. Um, and you know, we don't have there's Robbie, opportunities there for people. It's now, a isn't great it? opportunity for Hugely someone. Usually transitional um, period for all positions, but specifically in the centre forwards. Longy is going to be there, but Longy's thirty one, yeah, or around that age. So you know. When Longy moves on, then it's Shawnee Maguire. Maybe Shawnee Maguire has a great chance. He's, out he's been out injured, and he seems like a really good lad, and he's done very well up to now. And he's been so unlucky, a bad injury, yeah, a hamstring, did, yeah. bad hamstring. So see how he comes back from that and gets back into the Preston team. You know, he's still trying to Forge get himself in the, in the yeah the team yeah. In, in Preston and, and in England. Yeah, and in England. So it's tough to expect him just to come into an Ireland team and you know do well. But again, it is that changeover, and he'll he'll have that chance. Um, Scott Hogan at Villa, but he's been around a you know, good few, good few injuries years. have curtailed yeah. him a little bit as well. So, you know, it's it's a little bit worrying. You know, why don't we have five? I suppose you could say we had consistently the same five playing at a good level. We don't seem to have that now. I think one reason is the fact that when you would have been coming through, we were playing four four two. Yeah. <laughs> there is no now we're in, in, yeah. in an era of the last five, ten years ish of you know, four three three, whereas it's an out and out yeah. one striker. So you're or actually not, producing less. Not with strikers. Liverpool, it's not exactly. They don't even know? play with a striker, really. Yeah. Do they? So but at still. the same time, though, we still have had Johnny Walters play a large period of his Irish career yeah. in a wider position. Shane Long would have spent a, yeah. a good bit of his time in a wider position. So it's not like there isn't a slot there if you're in a yeah. if you're a traditional type of a centre forward. You can still get into the yeah. Ireland team. Yeah. We just don't have. There just there's no one there at the moment. So come here. What's next? Are you a bit scared about the next? Chapter? Oh, are you yeah. excited? I'm excited about it. Actually, um, it's. I'm trying to figure out. Wh- do I split my time and do loads of little things, or do I concentrate on one big thing? Whether it's coaching or media, or mm. I've got horses at home. They breed uh, national hunt um, horses. So, do I put my all my eggs in one basket, or do I? And I'm at the moment. I'm just flicking around between. Tell us about the horses. That, how how seriously about? Well, know, my dad breeds horses. He we have like 60, 70 horses at home. Um, all breeding to to sell at three or four years of age, and that's the aim. I've got four mares, four fo- four mares going to fall in the next six weeks or so. Mm. Anyone wants to follow on, uh, I'll set up an Instagram it's account. Gone. You know, no anyone? How, how hands on are you on day to day basis on that? I will be coming more hands on now. I did. My dad brought my horses, looked after them, fed them. You know, with his own mares, obviously, and it just an add on. And he would, you know, they all have to be brought to stallions, and they all have to be bedded and fed, and and I have to, you know. Jump and chip now. I told you I'm doing my uh, driving test to get to be able to pull a horse box. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, I'm not allowed to pull a horse box. Really so. So, <laughs> so you might see me wandering around Wexford if anyone sees me with L plates to get my uh, horse box license. <laughs> so you know I'll be bringing those mares to the stallions in the next uh, few months and. Thankfully, and you've done a little bit of the media. Yeah, I have air sport. Yeah, I've done a bit and just. You know, radio interviews and different things like that, and no more than I would have really done during my career anyway. You know, to be honest with you, um, and it's something I. It's not, you know, it's just something. I don't know if it's the future in it or not, but I don't mind doing it. It's fine. It's, well, today gets me out of the house, gets me a pair of stuff to do. Find your feet, don't yeah. you? Let's find your kind of path. And, and I do right I want to yeah. different? I don't know if avenues. I want to specifically concentrate. Oh, I like having, you know, you've got options now, and you've yeah. time. Yeah, you exactly. have time. But is there a small fear that? You know, you're back down at Wexford, you're among your people again, you're working with the horses, your your family are settled again, that you might just become too comfortable and whatever hunger you have yeah. just never returns. And yeah. you're, 50 years time, that's where you exactly. still are. Exactly, yeah, there is. Obviously, you know, you uh, something to really get stuck into. Um, and is it soccer? We spoke about and do my, uh, I'll probably do my badges now starting this summer. And do you want to? Do I want to go down? I've learned so much, and so many managers that we all talked about. And you think do, you want to give that? You know, you've learned that knowledge. Why? Why waste it? Why not use it? And then we spoke about before the show. A you know, manager's job, you know, is it's a nightmare. My, you know, you're moving my kids playing soccer as it is. But do you want to become a manager and lose four games and talk? Ring your wife and say, "Listen, get the kids out of school. We're moving here, there, wherever now." So, it, it's something you really have to to think long and hard about. I'm going to get my badges, so. You know, that's one step down the road to it to have them and to have that option. But um, it's a it's a it's a tough job. I admire any manager who does it. It's dedicating your life to it. I think you know. I don't know. You don't know till you're in the, those shoes. But I think I'd I'd be able to switch off. But no, none of them seem to be able to. They seem to age very quickly. Um, who of your former teammates do you think will be most suited? I think I know what you're going to say. It's yeah, let me think. Um, Ireland teammates. Yeah. I think John O'Shea is going to go down that route. 
Yeah, well, maybe not. He's big into horses as well, actually. Maybe he'll come help me uh, <laughs> move back to Waterford. I can't see him looking out the horses. <laughs> <laughs> he can buy some off. <laughs> I think that'd be more him. Yeah. Right, listen, I just want to have a quick chat about very sad news this week. Ryan Mason had to retire at the age of 26. He fractured his skull in that innocuous challenge with Gary Cale. It was the 22nd of June, 2017. Dave, you were commentating on it. 61 mm. minutes after that collision he actually had surgery 14 metal plates and 42 staples yeah I'd, I was in the commentary box with Kenny I think and the commentary position at Stamford Bridge is a mile from the pitch mm. but he had no idea it was as serious as it was as it was as it proved to be obviously he was carried off on a stretcher but I mean we've seen any number of head collisions where the guy's carried off on a stretcher it wasn't there wasn't the same feeling I was in the commentary box when Seamus Coleman broke his leg you knew immediately because we had pictures of it this is very serious but um, when Ryan Mason was being carried off you just assumed that it would take him a couple of weeks to get over it and it'd be, even then when you heard, learned that there was a skull fracture yeah. you still felt that this will, won't be an issue we saw Peter Cech coming back yeah. for example but for him to have to retire and not having kicked a ball in the meantime is desperately sad for him and because he was just such a prospect when he was at Tottenham part of that little clutch of midfielders that were all coming through at a very similar time um, and it just it's um, it's a really I mean, when you look at yourself and you say you kind of had ambitions to play for another year or two yeah. you must look at Ryan Mason oh, yeah, and think well how blessed was I exactly you know 20, what did you how many plates did he have 14 like hearing that now it's not surprising would you want to come back after that no, you know it's, it's, uh, but he was only on a, f- a few months ago I think I seen him on Sky Sports News doing a, a game and he was very focused on coming back but he did say he would be advised, obviously, by the neurologists yeah. and specialists and what have you. But it's, it's I can imagine even <coughs> hitting the ball with fourteen plates in your head. The, the, the I suppose the fear psychologically alone would put you uh, put you off doing it. And how would you? Yeah, I, I would. I don't think I'd be able. To, you'd be able to go into a, a you know challenge or anything with the same. It was it? You, know. you 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 toyed with the idea, and it was just, you went for the second opinion. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. You know, thinking I could I could manage it and get around it, and I went for a second opinion, and I got the same. <laughs> And then again, it wasn't you need to retire. It theirs was in our opinion. You know, you can stay playing, Kevin, but in our opinion, you should. So, you know, I'm 34. You know, as my wife said, what are you doing? You're 34. Just take that advice and and go with it. You know, whereas he's 26 to, to have to make that decision. Um, you know, when you've your best years basically ahead of you, is that the, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, makes you realise how lucky we were to get basically all the way through our career and not touch with nothing. You know nothing, and you think of all the challenges and the bad challenges you would have got connected with, and you never, you know, to, that was a freak incident to, to have that. Um, you know, for sixty minutes after a game and operation, fourteen plays. Staggering, isn't it? So, yeah, you know, I'm surprised he's even thought about or tried to come back come from back. that yeah. level of. You know, has he been training and and and? I'm not know. sure what level he got back to. I'm not too sure, but <laughs> very very sad. Um, did you watch the Alan Shearer documentary? Oh, I have watched it. Yeah. What yeah. did you think? Yeah, it was interesting. <clears throat> you know, it was all obviously older players and and that side of it, but. You know, it, it's so, um, you know, just speaking to the experts and all as I have done over it, there's no, uh, again, the evidence, there's no doc, there's no definite in anything. It's inconclusive. Yeah, it's very inconclusive. There isn't a big enough sample no. size yet. Like, we may have to wait 20, yeah. 30 years. It's the same in rugby. I mean, Brian O'Driscoll has often talked about that his generation of players, It's they will be the guinea pigs. They are the guinea yeah. pigs. It's, it's when they're... 50, 60. Um, information medical records are looked at in 30, 40 years' time that they'll have a far better yeah. idea of where they are. Um, we're not going to have time for Tuesday's Champions League we've had that kind of a chat with, with Kev I want to finish just on a little word with Liam Miller um, I didn't know Liam particularly well at all but obviously very very sad news um, you were at his funeral on Monday he was, um, yeah. he was an ex-teammate of yours obviously it was such a shock you know I you know, everyone he's such a was such a nice lad. He was a quiet and everyone think oh Liam was a quiet lad, but he was a quiet but he was very funny and sharp witted. You know, he was you'd think he was quiet until you got to know him and seeing his wife and kids. You know, we, we go to the funeral and we all go home afterwards and you know, we might chat about it once or twice now and then but you know, they're left with, with that, you know, and, and it's horrible but see the same way kids are the same age and to see them walking after the coffin it just makes you think, you know, he only found out in October. Um you know, it's horrible, horrible thing, and uh, you know you can only, you can only 
and Nigel and what is his poor Pain and grief they're through, going through yeah. obviously and yeah, we wish him obviously the best um, listen that's all we've got time for today um, really really good to have you and appreciate you coming in Dave thank you for Cheers. your company uh, we're back next Thursday you can download it the off the ball website make sure you're back here next Thursday thank you <laughs>